This conference will now be recorded. This conference will now be recorded. I just got on you. You said to pay the sign. Good afternoon, uh, or good morning, or good evening, uh, everybody. Um, this is uh, Joost, your moderator for the day. And um, we're actually about to get started. We're still expecting quite a few folks to join us. In the meantime, I'll, uh, I'll show my face to you to the extent that you can see me. Um, but I suggest we wait another few minutes to, to let some other folks uh, uh, also sign in and join us, and then we'll get uh, started uh, quickly. So we try to uh, stick to our timings. Thank you. So hang in there. We'll be uh, with you again shortly.
Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, let's get started here. Um, welcome. We got a really exciting program uh, set up for you this afternoon with some excellent speakers and some really cool innovations and uh, new angles on how to leverage data. Uh, in the context of uh, sustainability, food security, and smallholder impact. Um, before we get to the meat of that, I would like to go through a couple of, uh, if you like, housekeeping comments. Um, um, I'm actually your moderator of the day, your host of the day. So let me first start with a couple of uh, practical uh, aspects. For starters, I would like to uh, reach out to you and. Uh, let you look at the right hand side of the platform here in which you are of your screen you could see that there's a chat box uh, you will see that also if you go to the bottom right where there's a circle basically a text box on which you can click and then the chat box will appear if you could be so kind to introduce yourself uh, maybe include your company or email address as well as an indication of what you would expect uh, from today's webinar, that would be most helpful. Uh, hi, Tim. Uh, hi, Val. Uh, so if you guys could do that as well. Uh, so next to your name, company, if, if, if it makes sense, your, your title or role, and an indication of what you would expect from today's webinar. So next to that, this, uh, the same chat box uh, will allow you to give comments or ask questions along the way. So the way we structure and format uh, today's webinar is that we will have a couple of demonstrations. We have a couple of presentations for which I will go in a minute. So you have the overview and uh, you will be having the opportunity, of course, to ask questions and make comments. But what do we want to suggest you do is that you put that in the chat box, the same chat box where you can as we uh, listen to the presentations. So we can then collect the questions and we can then structure that and uh, ask the speakers to comment during the Q&A session at the end of the presentations. In that way, we have, a, you know, we have it structured that we can make sure that everybody gets a chance to ask his or her question and get that properly addressed. And it will also allow for a bit of interaction and maybe some fun discussions, who knows? Um, so that is all comments and questions uh, in the context of the chat box. Finally, uh, a few more points here on the webinar itself in terms of the fact that it will be recorded. So uh, you will receive a follow up email within the next few days where you find a link to the presentations, as well as a recording of today's webinar if you want to share anything with others or you want to re-listen to some components of the webinar um, and obviously you're welcome to share this with your colleagues or friends so um, all our speakers and if i see that correctly not all of them have done that yet uh, will have their cameras on so you can see who is who uh, and and sort of can identify them and link them to their names uh, but we would like to ask you to please disable your camera, although we would love to see all of you, of course. But we also want to manage our bandwidth and connectivity and to avoid any uh, uh, noise or, or side, uh, 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 um, distractions uh, to please mute uh, if you're not speaking. Um, so, with that having said, I uh, would suggest that I give it, uh, you know, one or two minutes then to further, you know, introduce yourself again on the right hand side, and then I will go to the uh, presentation and the overview of today's uh, speakers. Um, so I will go now to the presentation for the day with the share screen. which you should be able to see by now. And as more of you guys sign on, I would like to kick off uh, by saying that 
this title is obviously a lot of big words in there, the path to food security, the power of data, obviously smallholders in the center. Uh, but we, what we really want to stress um, is that it is key in this context to understand that at the end of the day, data only makes sense if they can serve African SMEs and African farmers. So I would like to use this context uh, for my scene setting presentation over the next couple of minutes. Before doing that, I first would like to take you swiftly through the agenda of the day. After my uh, comments and remarks, um, I would like to introduce Venetia and uh, Grace who have some really exciting news on the fertilizer watch, which has just recently been launched. And you will have the opportunity not only to have a, a live demo of the type of insights you can generate from there, but also on how to actually get access yourself to this uh, wonderful innovation and excellent visualization of, of real grassroots data. This will be followed by uh, actually a, a tradition in many ways, but more and more interactive as it has evolved over the years, which is the African fertilizer map, which will be presented by Antonella, again with a live demonstration as well, uh, and that really presenting a true portal for Africa when it comes to the fertilizer market dynamics. Then there will be an interesting, uh, a pretty exciting phase as well, because we will have two entrepreneurs to present their story and their view on how to look at the agribusiness in Africa in, and, in, and, and in the world, really, when you use data in a smart way and manage that in such a way that it doesn't only impact the supply chain efficiently and production, but it can also build a business. So that will first be done by Ronald, who will tell you about AgriSim and how they work and what they do, followed by Viresh, who will talk about the trading platform he has launched with his fellows uh, under the name of Fruitful. So uh, after having had all these presentations, we will get into the Q&A session. Obviously, as I mentioned uh, during the introduction, you, will, you can ask your questions already during the presentations. So you don't have to make any notes uh, uh, first or, or lose the thoughts along the way. You can immediately drop those questions on in the chat box and we will try to accommodate all of them and hopefully get them uh, answered satisfactorily. So after having done that, we would like to end up with our CEO uh, sharing some closing remarks uh, 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 to, to, to basically mark the end of the day and, and, and provide a, a brief wrap up. And hopefully we've had a few, uh, two, two exciting hours together. So let me first give you a little bit of context on uh, how we believe we should look at the context of why data is so important. If you just look at the actual data on what is happening today, what is happening as we speak, uh, we all know, and I'm sure that we'll come back again uh, a couple of times, that you know demand is rapidly outgrowing supply in terms of local production. And many argue even in terms of global production. Um, while, and I'm happy to see that more folks are joining us, while at the same time population is increasing and obviously the need for food is increasing for multiple reasons. At the same time, there's still a huge opportunity just to triple production of food crops as is with existing arable lands. But the problem is that a lot of the farmers who could actually accomplish that are not properly reached and not effectively because they don't get advice punctually and they don't get and receive the training consistently and at scale. And on top of that, there's no structured supply chains. There's no well-structured markets to accommodate that demand, that market dynamic, to secure the offtake for the farmer, but also to provide a proper supply for the existing demand. So how is this going to be addressed? Well. If you look at today's uh, 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 presentations, I think there's two, three core themes which can really 
uh, drive food security while leveraging the power of data. This is a cross market insight. So you actually know who you target and what you do for whom based on facts. Retail trading, which helps to accommodate and professionalize the supply chain from producer to processor to the marketplace to the end consumer and vice versa as well to the actual primary producer when it comes to the input side. And finally, when you look at that producer to optimize the farmland. So how can that be done? Because obviously we understand it and obviously a lot of people talk about how we can better do that using all these innovations and agri-tech and smart solutions and all that. But at the end of the day, you see a lot of people struggle with it. Why do they struggle? Because if you want to use data, there has to be a logic in order to convert that into impact. And that impact has to be measurable, but it also has to be relevant. The key way to do that in order to translate this into food security is by having on one hand proper partnerships in place, public-private partnerships. So you have key stakeholders who are indeed engaged and involved and the business model. So actually a profit and an ROI, return on investment is accomplished because otherwise it cannot be sustained and it cannot be scaled. So if you look at AFAP, AFAP has been active exactly in this core space when it comes to the power of data. And I must say, uh, having looked at AFAP and the way they work over the past uh, two, three years myself in person, it's really amazing what they have been able to accomplish with real grassroots work across multiple countries in Africa with practical business support, practical support, but, uh, most of all, actionable advice, which translates into real supply chains which function and sustain themselves with true impact and true engagement of farmers who can do their business better because they get access to inputs at the right time in a way that it's affordable but they also are linked up to markets so they have an offtake so they can actually you know also liquidate their own uh, uh, obligations as well as make a decent living and as AFAP has been able to contribute to that and co-build and co-create this uh, a lot of data has been uh, uh, collected, uh, but particularly a lot of insights have been accomplished. And that can be used for some key needs if you look at the, the needs in the marketplace, which is about collective action and standards. Because you can have that many data as you like, but if they're not properly standardized in some sort of way, you know, it's difficult to add them all up, it's difficult to compare them, and it's difficult to make them actionable. Secondly, AFAP has been able to build a strong and powerful network. This network tells which they have initiated themselves or in which they have been invited given the work as AFAP. And that is not just about the farmers per se or the public sector, uh, but also about the industry, about the small, medium sized enterprises who are so often forgotten uh, as the missing middle, as they're often called. But nevertheless, using the advances of digital technology, there's so much more we can do on that front to leverage these networks. And finally, if you look at data from a different perspective, what we have learned from an AFAP's perspective, there's so much wealth in using data in terms of better assessing and better benchmarking. So you can make really actionable programs based on really practical concrete priorities, whether that's in the area of policy, financing, or, or digitization for that matter, and certainly also for extension. Uh, this is key in order to be able to have true impact and really leveraging the power of data. So I think it's important to, to have that context well uh, in view, and also to understand how AFAP has been able to learn from this and translate that into its work. Because at the heart of AFAP, obviously there is this public-private partnership framework and, and working model in which we engage all the key stakeholders. But at the heart, it is about the inputs of suppliers before and during the planting season. And it's about the output aggregating during harvest and post-harvest reducing losses and increasing farmers' income. And if you look at the model, 
whether that's pre-production process, where you have to have ensure that the smallholder farmers are indeed able to get access to the financial market, so they get access to you know, the dealers and the right inputs at the right time, at the right price, in order to come up with these outputs and accomplishing those yields, getting the right training. It's then linked to how it then helps to further accommodate the whole supply chain, liquidate and set off whatever obligations they have and making sure the market is properly provided with the right outputs, whether that's a processor or whether that's a retailer, or whether that's an end consumer. And that's in that key area, uh, it, it is where AFAB really helps and plays a core role. So just a quick few examples on how we then use that into specific solutions. This one is about actionable priorities, where you use digital extension. Uh, which are tied to both input and output market linkages. So this is about supporting a farmer who, who can provide to a processor, who actually, or an, and an aggregator for that matter, who actually needs that to properly plan his, his processing unit and to do you know, properly, proper procurement. But at the same time, the farmer himself or herself needs to do the right things at the right time. And we get best practice and right input management and proper record keeping so they can optimize their yield, improve their financial planning and get access to services because they actually want to exist to they have a track record. And by the way, it helps also to excite, make farming more exciting for, for young folks and collaborate better. This only works if you have real grassroots data, which are properly aggregated, which is one example on how we work with taking extension to the next level but also allowing existing extension networks to increase their reach. What it also does is as you aggregate data, you can better have efficiencies in terms of targeting, which indeed leverages your extension infrastructure, as well as your yield management, because you basically know better which buttons to push. But this is an example of Nigeria, where you can basically see by state, which areas are red, which are yellow, which are green. Depending on the state, which is red, you can then zoom into the actual state and see, okay, which areas or districts there is indeed a red situation. And in this context, red is pretty straightforward. During the time which has passed, a certain number of tasks should have been completed. If they haven't been completed consistent with the time passed, the, the color of that district or area or state for that matter changes. So then you can zoom in in that area and say, okay, what's the cause of this? Is it a specific farmer group? Is it a specific task? And how does that link to the realized and expected yield? Is it linked to the, the right inputs? Is it linked to certain activities? Or is it linked to other aspects which have been ignored and need intervention, training, or insights? Um, and this is just one way of taking it from a macro level to a very specific targeted individual level and vice versa because it's based on grassroots data. A similar way, but from a different angle is in the area of policy, policy review, design and implementation. If you indeed understand what the market maturity is, if you like, uh, in a country, so you look at the status of fertilizer policy regulations, quality of fertilizer, market access, R&D, institutional support, and you tie that to a rating and a model, you can then link that to measurable ways of putting that into context and get some key indicator scores, which can help rate the status of that specific market. And link that to policy a country can then take in order to address those needs and basically help develop the market into the next stage, enabling the environment increasing investments, but doing the right thing at the right time based on data. So, back to the theme of today. Having said all this, um, it's about three core themes we're gonna to discuss today. Market insights, retail trading, and farmland optimization. And um, I'm really happy that I have had the opportunity to give you a bit of a you know, a peek under the hood, if you like, in terms of uh, uh, what in our view is so important if you want to make this successful. Again, if data is not linked to logic and that logic is not translated into real impact, which can then be 
such that there is a proper embedding in effective public-private partnerships and a business model and a reasonable return on investment so it can sustain and scale itself, it's going to be very hard to make that at work for the farmer and it's going to make it very difficult to make that at work for the SMEs because it will not sustain, it will end the moment a program or an intervention or a government initiative stops. And obviously that's what we do not want. So I'm really excited now to take you to the next uh, phase of this webinar and get into to the real meat of all this uh, with some uh, different examples of market insights, for farmland optimization, and on effective retail development of the supply chain. So uh, we will now move to our first speaker, Vinisha, who works at Development Gateway, a, a very strong partner of AFAP and very successful with their VIFA program, which is visualizing insights on fertilizer for African agriculture. And uh, I'll be happy now to hand uh, the, the speaker, if you like, the microphone over to, to her and uh, also to Grace, who basically will have uh, not really a joint presentation, but a, a, a complementary presentation and overview of the Africa Fertilizer Watch as well. And Grace is uh, next to being a very strong partner and associate with, uh, with AFAP, but she is a coordinator at IFDC based in Kenya and a strong specialist in the area of fertilizer and for the AFO, the Africa Fertilizer.org platform. So with this uh, having said, I will now stop sharing my screen and hand over the floor to Vinisha and Grace. Thank you. Thanks, Suze. Um, can you see my screen? Excellent. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Um, okay. So let me first start out by introducing myself and introducing the program. And I'm, I don't have a presentation for us to look at. I'm just going to take a deep dive into the dashboard that we're about to launch actually on Tuesday, 1st of September. Um, so my name is Venisha Bhatia Murdoch. I'm a senior learning advisor at DG. Um, we are a technology nonprofit based in Washington, DC, but we have offices all over the world, more specifically in Kenya, um, Senegal, and Argentina, then it goes on from there. Um, so I lead a program called VIFA, Visualizing Insights on, on Fertilizer for African Agriculture, it's a mouthful. Um, it's a four-year program that is supported by Bill and Melinda Gates foundation that began in 2019. Um, I, as, as we said, AFAP and IFDC are both our key partners here. Um, what, I'm, what I'm showing you here is actually the About Us page on the dashboard. Um, the dashboard is um, one of three that we will be launching. This is the first one in Kenya. We will also be launching one for Ghana and Nigeria. Um, one of the key challenges about data in the agriculture sector and especially in the fertilizer that is that data are often in lots of different locations in different formats that are challenging to access and i'm sure some of you have been in a situation when you have asked for some agriculture data and you were sometimes literally handed keys to a room with paper stacked to the ceiling um, maybe not that extreme, but you know, like you have data just handed to you in a way that you can't really use it. Um, also, in the case of fertilizer sector, the, the data is also in the format that's not always usable. So, for example, just getting raw data from customs doesn't help help you understand. Um, and so, situations like this make harnessing data really challenging when it comes to making the decisions. And so the VIFA program was designed to um, holistically address sort of the supply demand and most importantly, the use of fertilizer data at both country and then as Africa as the regional level. Um, and the VIFA brings together sort of 
the disparate data, by utilizing what is already available through partners like AFAP and IFTC, um, and then investing in innovations to fill in key data gaps. And we'll talk more about that through, through the COVID watch dashboard that we will see soon. And then effectively sort of presenting this information that matters the most to both public and private sectors to make decisions. And so the goal of the dashboard is to meet the needs of the decision makers in the public sector, private sector, so that they ultimately can use it to inform that, as you said, that the right products are available at the right time in the right market, so that in the end, the farmers could use them. Um, and so this dashboard was designed through a very rigorous co-design approach, where we held several workshops with public and private sector um, key players in the countries um, and to define their use cases. So start out with what decisions they need to make, like, and then link it back to the data that they need. And then to actually co-design each of the graphics that you're seeing right now. Um, and so based on what you see here, um, there are four main parts to this dashboard. So there's price, there's use, availability, and policy. And um, these were are the, the themes that the stakeholders wanted to package the information in. Um, and then based on their stakeholders' prioritization again, we also chose like four main graphics to show on the homepage of this dashboard. And so the first, um, I'm, I'm going to walk you through the graphics and sort of the story behind them, and then I'll show you quickly what look what it looks like in, in the detail pages as well, and then I will pass it back to Grace to show you sort of how we closed a more immediate gap with the COVID response as well. So um, the first graphic that you see here is um, the price and more specifically the cost buildup. Um, it we want the both public and private actors wanted to understand what makes products cost a certain way in a certain market. Um, and this graphic helps you sort of analyze this information cost buildup by year. So you can select what year you wanted to do this analysis for. You can select it by product, and then you could do the analysis not just at the national level, say at the main port, but also at a specific location in the country. So how much did the product cost to get to a, a key market in a country? And then if you click on any of these components, it allows you to look in more depth on what are some of the costs that take you there. Um, and then of course we have the sources on the bottom if you are wondering. Um, the next graphic here that the, the, the stakeholders wanted to understand was um, uh, national average consumption. Um, and the users wanted to know at a very high level, first of all, are the farmers using enough product in the country? And so for public sector, this is needed to understand how is the progress being made toward the Abuja declaration um, of uh, using the line here uh, to say, okay, are, are we reaching the goals of 50 kgs per hectare? Um, and then for private sector, this meant at a very high level understanding the application rate and the demand in the country. So in this graphic, you could do the analysis by the year. Um, you could do the analysis by specific nutrients you wanted to look at. And then um, if you hover over any of the pieces, you can see what the um, specific application is for that nutrient. Um, the third graphic here explores the product availability. So go, go going back to the original point that do we have the right product in the market? Are they available at the right time? Um, and how much is available. And so this graphic, again, was needed across both public and private sectors. Um, and so you could do the analysis by first selecting the, the date range. So within a specific 
period um, we wanted to look, cover some some seasons or not you could select the products if, if you know what product you want to look at you can go and choose those here and then if you hover over them you see the values in in them um, and then the last graphic here is the policy page pop, pop sorry the policy um, information so you want to understand like both public and private sector again that what is the government footprint in the market right and we did this um, by putting together imports data that shows what is the product being imported for open market what is the product being imported for subsidy and then we took it a step ahead and said of the open market product that was imported what is um, then being blended locally then being subsidized and so hopefully this sort of gives you an overview of how you know listening to the stakeholder demand listening to the needs to make decisions and linking it back to data sort of creates a graphic that meets the needs of the decision makers um, and then from the home page here you can also click on uh, the price here or say here to navigate to the price page and to save up the time on loading I, I've just preloaded it here um, and so if you if you go into detail for a price page you'll then can say okay we understand what the cost buildup was generally now I'll take a deep dive into say how has the cost change over a time period so this is looking at cost buildup by years oh, over five years right now you can choose uh, up to two, three, whatever you need. You can select the product again, location, categories, et cetera, and you will see the information again. You can click on the box here and you'll see the values uh, in more detail. Um, and then on top of it, you understand cost buildup, then you wanna know what does the retail price look like in the market in a specific location. So you have a map with this. If you click on a dot here, you'll see the retail price in that location. Again, you could choose uh, the product filter, the location to do analysis. Um, the next one is understanding how has retail price changed over time. So again, same information as you know a snapshot in, in time right now, but then looking at evolution of that change. Um, and then the last two graphics link that together. So next is what do we? What does if this is a retail price? What does the FOB price look like? What was the inter international price like? And then you can compare the two by putting the retail price together with the FOB price to monitor those trends. Um, the next page is looking more at the use. So as I showed sort of at the big picture level, you know, you can see what is the national average application rate. Okay, great. But what is the what does that tell you underneath it? So first you want to understand apparent consumption. Um, and so you can select that and by choosing the years you want to look at, the products, and then if you hover over any of the, um, the colors here, it'll tell you the name of the product and the amount. Um, and then taking, again, the consumption information into more depth, you know, you can look at it by apparent consumption, you can look at it by like actual consumption. So um, to get there, first you need to understand cropland or production so we have a map for that that shows you you, you can cho choose the crops you want to look at the years and then if you click on the box it'll tell you the amount of land that was under cultivation for that crop type and then as you scroll down you'll under you'll see that okay so we know how much land is being used we know the general amount that's being consumed but now if you wanted to make decisions you need to like break that down by crops right so then you can here's a a, a chart that 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 shows sort of the top consuming crops um, and then we have this categorized as the food crops or cash crops um, currently we're just we have them all here and then you can do the analysis okay so maize is like how much does it consume by volume by area cultivated um, and then you can do this same analysis as a pie chart to see what is the portion for that crop in the, the total volume. Um, and then the last one is the fertilizer use by crop. So understanding, okay, at 
national level. This is the consumption, you know the, you know the land under cultivation. Now, what does that look like by, by individual crop type in detail? So if you, here's a map, you can choose the years, the crop type, and then if you click on any of the locations, you'll see the amount in there. Um, and then the last ones are the, the same graphic that, that you saw on the, the home page. So this sort of gives you a, a picture of how um, the user stories in the beginning through the co-design process could be more broken down into specific needs to make decisions to like tell a story on the price consumption that can ultimately impact how people want to choose um, to see information to make, make sure that they're making the right calls for their stakeholders, but ultimately increasing the use of fertilizer in Africa. Um, one of the things I didn't talk about is actually the gaps in data. Um, and so as you can see, like sometimes accessing data could be challenging and, it's, and one reason is availability of the data. Um, and Grace, uh, we'll talk more about that, but when the pandemic began, we had to quickly move to collect new type of in information and, and repackage it for our stakeholders to make some decisions on the spot. And so I'm going to hand over to Grace to, to, to talk, talk about how they worked on uh, making, to, making a, another dashboard for COVID watch. Um, I am trying to flip back over to stop sharing my screen, Grace, so you can take it over. Thank you, Venetia. So, Grace, you're on. Thanks. Sorry? Sorry, that was me. Uh, no, you're on. Just, just pay attention to the time, please. Thank you. Okay, sure. Yes. Um, so, um, as Venetia put it, um, I'm Grace Chilane, I work with uh, IFDC, um, the Fat International Fertilizer Development Center, the fertilizer market specialist. And uh, today I'll be taking you through uh, a new product, a relatively new product uh, known as the COVID Africa Fertilizer Watch. So, we created this, uh, of course, in response to what's happening globally, uh, but uh, more specifically to understand what uh, what impact, if any, COVID would be having in the fertilizer sector. So um, we, uh, we initially had uh, one pager uh, documents that we would develop uh, starting from April all through to um, June. And uh, as you can see, the, uh, this is part of an archive that would show the different publications we did by region in West Africa and in East Africa. So in East Africa, we were publishing bi-weekly, and in West Africa, it was a weekly watch. And ideally, what this would be would be a one pager trying to give a description of the impact COVID has had in the different uh, indicators, which I'll show you. And um, this is just quickly to show you the different products that we had. And we had one for East Africa and West Africa. So quickly taking you back to what then we decided to develop in July is uh, having an interface where uh, people could quickly come get the information, understand what's happening at a country level, understand what's happening based on the different indicators that we're looking at. And then uh, this information is free to access. You can download it. And, uh, and the main purpose for this is uh, just to inform any, any possible issues that would come up uh, on food security. So this is to check on, this is to check on uh, if, if there will be a limitation on access to fertilizers, and then if if so, then what what's what are the repercussions of this? How would it affect food production, and then eventually uh, food insecurity? So just quickly taking you through uh, this dashboard uh, is uh, going to be a three month initially a three month dashboard. Uh, so we started in July, and we'll have one in August next week. Will be published next week, and then we'll have uh, another one for September. So if you come to the home page, you get an assessment of what's happening overall in, in West Africa and in East Africa. We'll give an update on the lockdown status uh, by the different countries, uh, fertilizer availability, what's happening at the ports, and what's happening uh, with movement of product. So um, if we would use a COVID trend just to get an assessment of what impact COVID, uh, COVID is having in terms of infection rates. 
And then what measures are being put in place by the different governments in terms of health measures? Are there any stringent ones? Are there any strong restrictions or uh, are countries not uh, sort of panicking about COVID? And then we'd also ask, we're also assessing what's economic impact. And with here, you can see we have different measures just to understand is it a low impact, is it limited impact, is it moderate or is there a strong impact? And then um, moving to something that is more fertilizer related, it's just trying to assess what's happening at the pot. Uh, pots, uh, is product coming in? Are operations being affected by uh, limited numbers of people allowed to work at the pot at a time? So changes in shift, uh, are, are ships allowed to allow crew, crew members to uh, get off in the different pots when they're bringing in consignments? It's just trying to understand, is there any congestion issues? And if you click on a country, then it would zoom in and it would give you a comment if there's normal operations. And you could check through the other indicators just to understand what's happening at a country level, what's happening. And, and, and if anything, uh, collecting this information on a monthly basis, uh, moving away from when we did it on a weekly basis, it's just also to allow policymakers or analysts to have enough information or background information to allow for creation of solutions uh, given the new issue that would arise uh, in the coming months. Then uh, ideally we would then move to, we would then move to um, domestic transport, just trying to understand how product is moving across the continent. And then we check transit. So this is just trying to understand what's happening at the borders. We're having a lot of issues with movement of products and that's based on different countries coming up with different restrictions, whether they've closed their borders or whether they're allowing regional movement or uh, whether the borders are open. So we're checking on this and then uh, moving closer to uh, agro input access. So here we are checking on our, our fertilizers actually available for sale. Uh, our farmers uh, being able to access fertilizers. And, and we also, um, we go a step further to understand pricing. If there's an increase in price, if there's a decrease in prices, what, what actual impact are we having uh, on accessibility of, of fertilizers? And then we would have sector responses if we have any government initiatives, private sector initiatives in place that would are trying to support and ensure there's no food insecurity. Uh, as a result of COVID and uh, over and above the general issues that are going on in Africa. And then of course, assessing stock availability. So as we were all well aware, like the East and, East and Southern Africa push on uh, seasons already ongoing or seasons were, being, uh, were getting ready for seasons to start. And so product was already en route or product was already in country. So we've not felt a significant impact on fertilizers or fertilizer availability. And so as we're assessing all the reason why we create this watch is just to assess uh, for seasons that are coming or in terms of accessibility or availability of product, just to see what general impact would this have and if COVID would play a role from an access perspective, but also from a consumption perspective. Um, yeah, so we would we would share the link. Uh, I will share the link for this uh, page, and you're allowed to uh, scroll through it, and then you would be able to get all the relevant information you need. So as I mentioned, this is updated on a monthly basis, and uh, ideally it's a January. To, uh, it was a July to September schedule, so we we for, we were foreseeing that uh, a COVID assessment would be short term, but uh, given how things are going, there's a tentative or there's expectation that this would go all through to December, but hopefully we would not have to assess the impact of COVID on food production beyond December. But um, we will cross that bridge when we get there in terms of understanding what else do we need to assess, what, uh, what additional data do we need to uh, continuously collect so that we will be able to inform, uh, would be able to equip policymakers, public and private sector with the right information to be able to inform our solutions to address uh, the current impact of COVID uh, in the fertilizer sector. I'll hand over back to you, uh, Yus. Yeah, it's wonderful, Grace. This is so exciting. I'm really happy that, that you guys have been able to bring this live 
and and real time with some real up to date information through our joint collaboration. And it would be great if you could share the access to the the fertilizer watch with all the participants. And yep. uh, obviously, uh, everybody will have the opportunity to change uh, contact where needed. Um, but again, uh, uh, great news, and well done, and thank you so much. Thank you. I'd like to to move on to uh, uh, Antonella Harrison, and uh, talking about interesting track records and 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 very important market insights already with a built reputation over the years. Clearly, uh, you're the right person here in this uh, panel, Antonella. So I uh, welcome the floor and uh, would like to ask you if you could share your um, uh, your your experience, but more important, also your, the current status of your portal on the fertilizer market dynamics in uh, in Africa. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Good morning to everybody. Um, and first of all, I'd like to thank Hefa for uh, inviting me to this webinar and um, for the ones who don't know me i've been in the industry since 1993 quite a few years um, in various form and shape but basically in the publishing industry starting as a as a reporter on the, on the fertilizer trade and then setting up my own company uh, and then selling eventually uh, to a big publisher and uh, and in the last five years since 2015 i'm uh, independent, completely independent on my own. You will see a couple of slides at the end if you want to know more about me and uh, some details at the end of my presentation. So I'm here today to talk about my new product, the AfricaFertilizerMap.com, uh, which was live on the 7th of August to coincide with the 100th anniversary of OCP which is the platinum sponsor of my project together with AFAP. Um, and I will uh, try to explain today how this sits within today's topics of discussion. We heard from the previous speakers how providing data um, in the right way, in the right context, will uh, give, secure more power and improvability ability to small old farmers, like to many other actors, to make the right decision. So harnessing um, means utilizing, controlling, channeling, and in my case, particularly visualizing data so that uh, not only they could be accessible, but they could be also more understandable, clearer, and therefore usable to all audiences. Then we said path to food security. So this is the process that with this data um, we hope to unlock to bring agriculture transformation and then food security to africa so this is um, the home page of my africa fertilizermap.com my website um, it is a powerful image already with a strong message because africa women and their empowerment is a key factor for Africa's agricultural development. At the top of this slide, you will see the navigation bar uh, of my website, which explains all the key elements of my data journey. Um, the, it is a website, but also has an interactive part of it, and we'll talk more about this. Um, for me, the Africa Fertilizer Map is a portal because it aims to be a gateway to Africa fertilizer data. It displays imports and exports from and into the various African country, manufacturing and blending plants and projects, consumption figures, as well as it shares the various initiatives that are being deployed by a number of uh, different and key players for the development of African agriculture. The portal has a history, uh, a path, which I will tell you more over the next few slides. But more than anything, I have to say for me, it is a very good and thorough cooperation with all the companies and associations that have been involved with me in this project, and which are indeed part of the path to food security. 
first of all, OCP Africa, which is a large producer, as you know, large producer in Africa, but is a very active uh, um, player in Africa, and particularly for the development of Africa Sub-Sahara. AFAP, you heard about all their initiative. These are my two kind sponsors of the project. Um, AFO, the African Fertilizer Org, uh, which uh, Grace represents here, is uh, my partner in this project. And uh, as you heard, is a major data provider of fertilizer statistic data and is hosted by the International Fertilizer Development Corporation um, Center. Uh, I also had the participation in data sharing in the project of IFA, the International Fertilizer Association, of uh, African Plant Nutrition Institute, APNI, uh, the Africa Union, uh, AUC, AGRA, the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, and the United Nations uh, Economic Commission for Africa, UNECA. So you can see a number of very uh, important uh, stakeholders. This, this slide will show you the printed version, the latest printed version of the Africa Fertilizer Map, which was produced in April 2020, obviously using data from 2018, because there is always a backlog in collecting all the, all the data by all the countries. Um, you can see that all possible data are represented on this map in a, in, and I'm trying I try to be as clear as possible by doing so. Um, this map is downloadable on my website together with the, the ones produced in previous years. It all started in 2017 when uh, Patrick Heffer from IFA suggested that I could do an Africa map. I had developed a trade flow map when I was the commercial director of fertilizer at ICIS, my latest company, in partnership with IFA. But at that time, when Patrick asked, I was on my own. Um, I could see the challenges because, as we heard before, the, the data on Africa were collected, are collected by different organizations with different methodologies, timing, um, et cetera, et cetera. But I could see the right purpose of it. It would be the first visualization tool for Africa data, and so it was. So I developed my first map in 2017, and then I developed 2018, 19, and 20, uh, which are all downloadable on my website, just to see the, the change and the progression on the data. Uh, each year, I, I try to add updated figures, of course, uh, thanks to the association, more information when available, uh, and in a clear and more systematic uh, way each year. While I was doing that um, and trying to improve all the time to make it more clear, more uh, understandable, you know, to put the data into um, context, um, two main things were happening in the fertilizer industry, but in the agriculture industry. Uh, one, the world was becoming more digital, and digitalization was the new must even for fertilizer use and agriculture development. So I thought about developing a website with an interactive part to display historical data and trends so that people could see the path, the development of the data, and also more detailed information, for example, on projects and plans, particularly blended projects, which have been indeed grown exponentially in Sub-Sahara Africa over the past few years. Um, when you go on uh, on my on the interactive part, you will see all these elements: imports, export, manufacturing plant, all popping up by using this icon. So, if, for example, if you pop on the blending project in Nigeria, you will have, I think, 17 names coming up with capacity and some details. You know, obviously. Um, I have, I hope, and I aim to uh, add more details as I go along in future years, um, thanks to the help of the association and everybody wants to help. Now, the second development, the second thing that was happening, as I said before, in the industry was that 
the more I was looking at data and, uh, and trying to gather more information on Africa, uh, the more I was understanding the path. And so I could see how fertilizers are crucial for agriculture, agriculture, how as well there were a lot of challenges from logistic to finance to cost and pricing, everything, um, in the overall supply chain from fertilizer to farmer and then to fork, uh, how there were many key stakeholders involved with the, within the private and the public sector, and now they were all doing good things for Africa, including, of course, my sponsor, OCP and AFA. So I thought that I should show in my website not only the data, the figures, but also I should share this knowledge, this experience, the numerous initiatives that needed and they were done to be to, to develop Africa, they should be shared on my portal so that the portal could become not only a gateway to Africa's data, but also a sharing tool and a place where actors along the agri-food supply chain, not only fertilizer, the agri-food supply chain, could understand more what it was required for the development of Africa agriculture and for food security. Uh, which ultimately are some of the key United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The portal should also be there to share experiences and successes, a success of all the company involved. So this is the purpose of my website, and I would say that fertilizer are key to agriculture, Africa's development and Africa's agriculture transformation is key to ensure food security and the end of, end of hunger and malnutrition to the continent, while at the same time increasing farmers' productivity and providing agriculture sustainability. So a lot of targets and purposes all together. So my portal is being shared and will be promoted by the Fertilizer Association and the companies involved, but also by um, some government uh, organizations, some United Nations organizations like UNECA, AGRA, AUC, uh, on the way to Abuja, the Abuja 2 Summit, which hopefully will be held in 2021 or 2022, we'll see, um, for the further development, the enhancement, the enhanced development of Africa's agriculture, uh, thanks to an, an effective partnership between the private and the public sector. So, and with this message, I would like to conclude my presentation. The next two slides will give you uh, more details of who I am and my contact details so that you Please do not hesitate to contact me if you want to share your experiences on my website, your project, and therefore be part of this important path to food security. Thank you. Wonderful, uh, Antonella. That's fantastic. And indeed, uh, quite an accomplishment what you have been able to, to built over the past few years because indeed data collection in Africa for this specific line of products is, is not obvious and to do that consistently and over a longer period of time is, is even really challenging as you outlined but I think we've made some real good progress and, and I think one of the key feats there is that you've been able to also tie up a lot of the different partners players and, 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 and stakeholders in that framework an ecosystem, if you like, in order to get to more consistency and and and, and more professional uh, uh, management, really, of those data, in order to uh, to accomplish some some meaningful insights on the fertilizer market and the real needs, uh, uh, you know, which can be derived from those uh, insights. So we can set our priorities straight and do that based on actual uh, data instead of our own uh, uh, perceptions of those data. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so we now would like to, to move to our next uh, presenter and we're actually getting more and more into the uh, business and entrepreneurship really now, but still with a very strong uh, 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 
uh, hook up with with data and 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 and. and looking at those data with a logic that actually can result in some significant impact. So I'm really happy to uh, to welcome Ronald here today, who can share uh, his work and his view on this important theme with you uh, as the CEO and founder of uh, AgriSim from the Netherlands. So Ronald, if you, if you would please like uh, to take over from here and uh, briefly introduce yourself and, uh, and, and take us through your uh, views and insights on this uh, important theme. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joost, for your introduction. Uh, very flattering. I hope I can uh, <laughs> work towards the expectations. Uh, I will now uh, start uh, sharing my screen. Um, so my we, uh, we are already busy, what you're going to see, with the last 10 years. So uh, we are busy with this, uh, and this means we have made a decision support system for smallholder farmers all over the world. So uh, in, in, in first instance, with the decision support system, the farmer does not have to fill anything out. Uh, we have a lot of default data, uh, either calculated, purchased from different sources, satellite drones, but also uh, soil data that we have uh, accrued over the last 10 years and made a calculation due to machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence. So um, we call ourselves smart farming, not to be mistaken with uh, other types of, uh, of farming like precision farming. Um, so um, we are very well rooted already in uh, some African countries. Of course, we're always looking for more in that sense. Um, so as you all know, this is not new. Uh, we are uh, really uh, um, trying to produce more food in the coming uh, 30 years. Uh, and that can also only be done by either technolo technologically improvements uh, like big data, uh, using that uh, for the advantage of smallholder farms, who is around 90% of total farmers. Um, so uh, that means that is you have to reach these people and have to convince them to use big data to uh, that can help them in their decision-making process. I'm not saying that the, uh, the data will take over because we will come to that. Uh, uh, data has also its limitations, as you understand, and you said it also, Joost, the, uh, um, the interpretation of data is another one. But we need to produce a lot of uh, food. So also 50% of the world's agricultural land is already degraded in a state that you have to put more fertilizers in this case. Yeah, we've talked about that a lot, uh, uh, but also compostation and other types of uh, things you have to do in order to get the same yield out of it. So uh, uh, that is... <laughs> Uh, in, the, in the last 10 years, we have a lot of farmers across the world, um, and whereby we created this uh, pyramid. So in principle, the farmer's main pain is that the revenue decreases. That is due to uh, customer demand, uh, uh, all kinds of pushing parts. So that means also the sales prices under pressure, the increase of costs because they need to get their yields out, the depletion of resources like, uh, let's say, like, like the soil, like water, uh, uh, all kinds of climatic disasters, uh, micro disasters in that sense. Um, uh, lack of education is another big one that we have found out uh, uh, during our interviews. Um, and also the fact that because of the lack of education, they tend to go towards traditional choices, which means the same crop rotation plan every year, which means if you do not know how to treat your soil uh, and how to treat your conditions in that sense, you really are into a uh, into the, the, the negative scissor, meaning that your costs will increase and your yield will either stay the same or go up a little with the steroid for fertilizer in this sense, but uh, the costs are not into balance with the revenues in that sense, because they choose normally low risk crops like uh, cereals. Uh, uh, like I said, 50% of the cereals is under land at this moment. So uh, that is quite something. This is all based on uh, uh, interviews that we uh, and our team conducted all over the world. So uh, with uh, Western European countries, as well as with uh, African countries, uh, Asian countries, uh, the South America and North America. Um, 
So how can we, what is the, actually the aim? The aim of our system, but in general, the big data system should be to have people, farmers in this case, produce more and better and make better use of the, especially natural resources. Now, um, how can we do that? We can do that by using our knowledge and experience, like like uh, uh, in the the, uh, the experienced countries, but also in African countries where there's a lot of knowledge and experience, but it is not um, widespreading in that sense. But the, the so this this sheet is basically built up out of uh, the main part is the middle part, which came up the most in our interviews as well. So uh, using knowledge and experience from our side, from the, the, the experienced farmer side, to get relevant and especially actionable, you said it already in your introduction, Joost, actionable data. Especially the actionable part out of big data is, is a big thing because um, my experience and our experience is that out of 100% of big data, only 5% is useful for actionability to to make something happen to do something say oh wow i have to increase my fertilizer or wow i have to uh, irrigate or yeah all that kind of stuff so or i have to create i have to choose a different product because the conditions don't match what i want to do so um so that is uh, uh, especially also combined from different data sources uh like i said we are using satellite drone uh, uh whatever kind of uh, public data but also uh, purchase data meteorological data all in in gis systems so um affordability is another thing that is really important uh, well my experience is people say why don't you offer it for free your system i said because then you're not taken serious because if people don't pay they just make it like it's if it's not true kind of so so but affordability is a very big thing in this thing, thing as well and as, as well as accessibility i mean cloud-based app-based uh, but it should be mobile uh ready in that sense because we have seen now uh, with all our users that like 60 percent is using their mobile to enter into these types of tools um readability is another one that uh, that goes back to the uh, part of the education, which means if uh, uh, a farmer is not that well educated, you don't have to tire him with all kinds of graphs and 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 about ratios that that are uh, uh, not inter interpretable or actionable of, of for this person. So you really have to say to get down to one figure in principle. That's the idea. So and uh, decision support means. The farmer should still be in control. I mean, these big data do not take over the farming. Yeah, uh, it needs to be a, de a, a decision, a guesstimate decision, let's say, yeah? better than before. Um, and of course, everything under the uh, data protection laws. So I think that is how you can actually um, get through to uh, use data for smallholder farms. Now. We have a solution for that, at least uh, one of the one of the solutions that are in, in there in the world. Um, um, our system, and I'll show you a video of two minutes. Uh, our solution uh, uh, gives you more production, more revenue, and better use of resources. So I will start the video now. Um, that will uh, Welcome become to Anderson, logical. The first platform that supports you in all your farming decisions. All you have to do for start is to create your parcel. Click on the map and determine the boundaries of your land. After you give your parcel a name and select basic cultivation details, you are all set to proceed and get essential insights for your farm. Agrisum brings all insights you need in less than a minute, like your parcel's climate data, as well as important soil parameters, like texture, pH, organic matter and so on. Based on all existing conditions of your land, Crop Finder shows you how suitable each crop is to your parcel and how much you can expect to earn. Agrisum analyzes thousands of different crops and enables you to compare possibilities for rain-fed or irrigated cultivation. All you need to do is to create your parcel. You can click on any crop on the list to reach all important information about it. You can see the suitability and potential revenue you can expect for different periods over the year for rain-fed and irrigated cultivation. You can reach details of your potential revenue for each crop as well as price forecasts and yield forecasts of next year. All other essential economic insights you need like historical prices, yield and production values are just a click away. Planning module lets you plan easily your production, revenue, crop allocations and rotations over several years. After adding crops that you want to grow from CropFinder, you can simply drag and drop crops to your field. 
you can easily adjust land you want to allocate for each crop. You can try and compare different planting dates, growth periods. It is possible to foresee instantly how much you can earn from each plan. If you need good ideas, you can get crop suggestions on different goals that you can select. It is that simple to make use of data, science and agronomy in your farming decisions. Start growing better with Agrisim today. So this was a rudimentary uh, movie of uh, our tool. It has uh, much more than that, but it's really targeting an actionable part for a farmer to show his production. So um, in summary, we have a global platform to match uh, 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 the right crop with the right location. So the moment that we have a latitude longitude, uh, that is the moment that all the data that we have on that parcel calculated, as I said or not, that is the moment that that all comes together. And that moment that you say, I want to see what my the crop uh, uh, suitability is that is the moment that you get uh, uh, all that data will run over more than three and a half thousand crops fruits vegetables and trees perennials um we have a forecasting uh which is uh like in 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 very in in, in the most areas uh, uh, we have uh, an accuracy of around 90 95 percent in the forecasting with the matching especially with the soil data it depends on how many measurement points we have the, the more dense measurement points we have, the better our machine learning algorithm has worked and uh, goes up to 98% accuracy, but it can also go full around 50% if we have less dense data on that. So uh, also you can improve it as a user by uh, putting your uh, laboratory soil report data in there. So the moment that we have acquired uh, accrued more than uh, a, 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 a normal portion uh, that you can uh, again run the, the, the new machine learning algorithm, that is the moment that your uh, whole area is becoming more accurate. So uh, simulation, uh, so uh, we have crop rotations, as you saw with the drag and drop. Uh, it says it tells you the, the, the seeding uh, date as well as the best harvesting date you can then compare that with economics like what is the best period to release uh, so you can then make a choice about uh, uh, should i uh, cold store it or should i try to cultivate it or harvest it earlier so i'm earlier in the market that kind of stuff so uh, another one is the the world search that was not in the movie and the world search is that uh, that's especially made for for corporate companies fertilizer producers whatever whereby you can actually um, click into a product and say i would like to see in this country south africa nigeria kenya whatever uh, where can i produce this the best so then the suitability will show up and at that moment that when the suitability shows up that is the moment that you uh, actually can uh, 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 go and drill down deeper and the tiles are changing into smaller tiles and smaller tiles and smaller tiles until you're almost into the parcel level so uh, um, so with AgriSim, there is a more sustainable agriculture production system because also we will have, and that's not yet in there, but we are releasing that in a month from now, uh, where we do uh, put the nutrient uh, uh, system in there, whereby every crop that we have in our system will also tell into the system, we put it into the system, that uh, the amount of nutrients uptake or uh, give to the soil back. So also including uh, the green manures and the cover crops, etc. So that's when you can calculate as a farmer how much nutrients you need to add in that sense. So um, it's also taking care of resources in a better way. Um, plan with insights on suitability and conditions you saw. Monitor performance and results. That's also what you have seen. Um, based on all the satellite uh, uh, pictures uh, that we have we can also monitor through the through the growth season uh, in how far uh, through hyperspectral cameras in how far uh, it matches the real growth uh, which we can then correlate again to the climate and to the soil um, analysis iterate and improve easily as i said you can change your soil uh, uh, um, parameters like pH value, et cetera, then you, we will calculate based on that. Uh, and we have an optimized farm management system whereby you can put in uh, every time you fertilize and what, how much every time you irrigate, how many liters per, uh, per hectare or per crop type or even per bed type in that sense. So that is in principle uh, how 
uh, our system uh, works. We try to uh, aim at smallholder farms. Uh, so our pixel grid is 250 by 250 meters. So uh, uh, there's not a, a, a macro thing and we are all under European Union uh, GDPR uh, law. Um, so in this idea is how uh, we feel that big data should be used because um, farmers that have low education, you can give them a lab report. We did that a lot in, during our interviews. This is a soil lab report. What does it tell you? And there came all kinds of different answers, but uh, they could not make that data connect together in a single report, kind of. So that is what we are doing for them. And then it's it's the farmer's decision to follow that or uh, what we normally see is a trial of uh, a certain uh, percentage of their, of their soil, of their parcel that they will try out with the recommendations we do. And we have seen uh, uh, incomes uh, uh, increase by by 300 uh, percent yields increase like mad compared to the average in in a region or in a country so um that is where i will uh, uh leave you thank you for your time if you have questions on the right bottom side there is my email address please feel free to uh, ask me any question uh, on the email or if you want to use our system, uh, there's also a demo uh, possibility uh, for you. So uh, thank you for your time. And uh, I'm, I, I will await the questions either with Yoast or uh, through the email. Thank you very much. Great, Ronald. Very exciting stuff and uh, fantastic. I know if you've, you've been very busy with this for number of years already and it's impressive impressive what you guys have been able to accomplish already and, uh, and and i'm very curious to see how this journey will further evolve uh, but i'm sure it will be uh, successful uh, thanks so much uh, again i just mentioned that also in the chat box if there's questions or comments uh, just jot them down in the chat box so we could try and uh, structure that as we move to the Q&A section, obviously you also have the opportunity then to, uh, to pose your question, but we also want to manage our time efficiently and make sure that everybody uh, can have his uh, fair share of uh, Q&A where relevant or that we can have a, a, a dis discussion among the, among the panel members uh, if there's uh, the opportunity. Um, but for now, I would like to move to uh, our last, last speaker of uh, the day uh, uh, in our panel, and that's uh, our good friend Firesh. Uh, Firesh is the CEO and founder, co-founder, I should say, uh, of Fruitfell. Uh, if I pronounce it properly, uh, Firesh, uh, uh, active in India, but uh, obviously, as I uh, as I have learned to know him uh, with an eye on the on the global perspective as well. So I'm very happy that he's here today to share his experience and findings uh, uh, with his work on this exciting proposition and trading platform with you today. And uh, I would welcome him now to uh, take the floor and uh, and uh, and share your insights with us. Uh, thank you, Viresh. Wonderful. Thanks very much. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure being here with everyone. Thank you very much for the for the invite uh, to share. Um, I would say the, the the India experience or the India case. I think some some solid uh, parallels to other uh, emerging or informal markets where you have a predominance of smallholder farmers and uh, you know micro and small enterprise that dominate to dominate retail. Um, you know that said, uh, I am Indian, but I was uh, I'm actually second generation Kenyan. I was born in Nairobi. So a big jumbo to all of our Kenyan friends that are that are on the line. Um, let me uh, share a screen here, um, and I'll talk about what we are uh, building in in India uh, as it pertains to uh, smallholder farmers and um, excuse me, it's on the top. Okay, um, as it pertains to smallhold uh, smallhold farmers and um, you know connecting them to to retail markets. So I I think one of the key uh, important things here is that 
Uh, well, today I think we've spoken a lot about uh, farm efficiencies, inputs, uh, fertilizers, and so on. You know, our, our perspective is that without transparent market data on the demand side, right, it's very difficult for a smallholder farmer to know what he's growing for, what sort of inputs to procure, you know, and, and so on. And so that for us is a, you know, part of our focus. And I'll walk through uh, some dynamics of the Indian market and how we're using data and, and technology to solve them. Okay. So the case of India, let's let's talk about some of the dynamics. Okay. Um, there's about 100 million smallhold farmers in, in India that usually cultivate uh, an area less than a hectare, uh, sometimes two, but this is sort of the the average size. So a lot of um, fragmentation, you, you could say, um, and largely informal operations. Okay, when you add to that a, a retail space that's dominated by 60 million uh, micro and small enterprise, okay, you can see the capillarity both on the supply with smallholder farmers and then getting goods to uh, a micro enterprise okay? uh, in an organized way, in an efficient way, um, you know, by providing some transparency, okay? which today uh, doesn't exist at all in the, in the market. We think there's a, uh, there's a massive opportunity to apply technology, particularly mobile technology, as, um, as was mentioned earlier, uh, to provide access to information and market information uh, to the actors on on, on both ends. Uh, when you add to that, that agriculture touches 20% of the GDP in India, uh, of, a, of a $3 trillion economy, uh, you know, we're talking about, um, even if there are small points of efficiency, uh, uh, the ability to impact a, a very, very large sector. Right? And it's a sector that, that touches about 60% of the employment in, in the country. Okay, so imp improving uh, supply chains, digitizing them, formalizing them, uh, providing access to formal capital, those types of things really has a uh, the opportunity to make a massive, massive impact uh, in a country like India, which today uh, is the you know largest producer of a number of uh, a number of commodities. Okay, so when we talk about impact, uh, the opportunity is huge. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the uh, fruit and vegetable retail in India is, is almost entirely unorganized. Okay? You have kind of an ancient open market trading system. Uh, there's no supply information that flows. There's no demand information. Uh, as you can imagine, um, there's no transparency on, on price data uh, that flows. And as you can see in the picture in the, in the middle, uh, also issues on, on food safety, handling, traceability, packaging, and in today's COVID environment, uh, even in a place like India, becoming more and more relevant uh, as, um, as we move through it. Okay? So you imagine trying to connect a, a, a small, a small hole farmer uh, pushing goods through these types of open markets into a, a, you know, a, a big city, the, the challenges are huge. You know, while the market size, the addressable market size is, is enormous. Close to uh, close to 100 billion dollars every every single year that's consumed internally, and we're not even talking about the potential for for export markets. Okay, the problem is uh, again the fragmentation and the informality on the on the retail side. It's uh, kind of formal supermarkets, as, as as some of the participants uh, on the call may be aware of, in in the West or in Europe or in the, in the U.S. Uh, only make up for about 5% of the market in, in, in India. Okay, the rest are you know, small and micro enterprise. Um, they have poor access uh, to quality supply. Typically, they have to borrow money informally uh, to, to fund their working capital, you know, et cetera. So that's where a lot of the, uh, we feel the, the inefficiencies lies. Uh, and naturally, you have... Uh, then traders or middlemen in the middle that reap the, the the margins. Okay, so the appreciation of price from farmer to the consumer in a big city, you know, can be upwards of of 500% uh, given the uh, lack of transparency. Um, you know, um, games being played in the in in the, in the middle. Okay, um, just to give you a quick idea on 
uh, and this is a, a 2017 data, but it's uh, relatively the, the, the same. Okay. Projected output in, in India, output, farm output, close to 200 plus billion uh, dollars. Okay. You know, un unfortunately, uh, there's about 80 billion in, in post-harvest, you know, waste. Okay. So as we look to, you know, feed a few more, a few more billion people by, you know, 20, 2050, whatever the number is, right? I mean, there's obviously a, a bigger piece of work to be done there. And a chunk of that, that then goes to the export markets. Okay. So internal consumption, um, you know, in India sits at around, uh, you know, 100, 100 billion. Okay. So where do we see the, the the role of technology in in this in, in this mix? Okay. It's a, a platform that we've created uh, natively on mobile. Okay, and there's some dynamics in in India and in other parts of the world that are that are helping set the foundation for this. There there are today uh, half a billion connected smartphones. Okay. Uh, in a country with 1.3 billion people, that's a that's a tremendous uh, penetration rate okay. and in the next five years it's expected that the country should reach close to a billion smartphones okay, which means almost almost everyone in the country connected uh, with access to applications with access to data with access to information that um, again that follows the theme of uh, of this conference around uh, actionable right? being able to act on 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 information okay um, India today has the, the the lowest data rates, mobile data rates, uh, in the world, which then also provides uh, easier access to to this type of information. So we think that the uh, the foundation is there to start connecting the, uh, the 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 capillarity on the both farmer and retail side with uh, direct sourcing, using te technology to then build direct market linkages to micro and small retail while we you know, eliminate these efficiencies in the middle. Okay. So we're looking at what we call an asset light tech smart model where we use technology to effectively digitize or enable um, you know, existing operations right, to make them more, more efficient. Okay. So the opportunity here for us is to really tech enable micro and small enterprises. Okay. There's an opportunity to look at uh, how we can digitize uh, you know, the existing you know, chains, supply chains, okay? And as you do that and start to have access and capture trade data, okay, think of, um, you know, uh, a country, uh, you know, with a $100 billion of transaction with virtually no point of sale data being captured, okay? So when you start to digitize, there's a trade data stream that you can now start to analyze, you can start to apply algorithms on um, and use that to, and not only improve the supply chain, okay, and provide value-added services to microenterprises and the farmer, but also now you have revenue history, you have transaction history that allow you uh, to then present formal capital. Okay. You can data drive lending, you can unlock financing opportunities, right, where most of these, you know, the players, the actors are borrowing informally uh, from money lenders or, or other sources at interest rates upwards of you know, five, six, seven percent a month, sometimes higher. Okay, which obviously is a drag on on earnings, which is a drag on efficiency, um, and 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 uh, poor outcomes both on the farm and uh, the the retail side. Okay, so what what Fruitful has built is a uh, is a mobile platform, trade platform, that allows the micro and small enterprise to order produce directly from uh, the app mobile app without having to go physically to a, you know, an open market as in the picture I showed earlier. Okay. What that allows us to do then is aggregate demand uh, and we can push that demand into the supply side. Okay. Uh, and when we say aggregate demand, it also means that we can start to run algorithms. We've got now predictive forecasting. Uh, we can look at seasonality. We can look at, um, you know, typically we have uh, festivals in, in India where, where consumers will take offerings to temples and uh, things of that nature, and we see spikes and for bananas and apples and and so on. So all of that we can put into the algorithm and drive uh, a predictive forecast, market data, price data uh, onto the supply side, okay, into the small farmer, uh, and uh, which are now called uh, cooperatives, you know, farmer producer organizations, okay. And this is data that they've uh, never had before. 
Okay, particularly in terms of forecast. Okay, we uh, we have now a reasonable footprint, close to you know, over 500 retailers uh, in the Delhi area who order from us, uh, and we can provide into the uh, the farmer organizations rolling forecasts. Okay, and these are now firm commitments. Okay, because we have the demand data through our retail footprint. We're able to connect that directly to the farmer and make firm commitments to to the, the the farmer or the farmer cooperative on the type of product we'll take. We can also push our kind of direct to market requirements in terms of sorting, in terms of grading, in terms of packaging, which also pushes value add uh, services to the to the farmer, particularly in in the rural area, okay, where products generally were sold in bulk, sold you know by the truck load. And what happens there is you have a dilution of value because even high quality products are mixed with the low grade products and you know the price typically falls to the floor right? so when we can push product requirements direct to market requirements we're pushing um uh, uh, you know quant quantity and pricing information uh, to the farm side this helps the you know the farmer manage inputs manage his operation um also manage kind of a harvest right? and what products he should and should not because we give them access to a direct a direct link okay the other piece that the the mobile technology and the data allows us to do is to process payments and and transactions electronically so we've uh, eliminated the the handling of cash and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second um we made the investment in supporting electronic payments earlier this year luckily just just ahead of COVID, um, and as COVID hit, there was a, a reluctance to to handle cash, but we were able to 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 manage uh, the end-to-end -end operations uh, without without paper and without cash, um, which also means that the payment cycles are faster, both for the farmer and and the small retailer. So you know, so cash is rotating faster. Um, you know, they're able to work up, uh, build up working capital um, cushions, if you will. And it's um, obviously it's a, it's a much more efficient way uh, to do stuff. Okay, the other thing that we start to do when you when you're part of the tr trade data stream is you can start to enable uh, you know micro borrowing, but micro borrowing based on uh, revenue. Okay, typically uh, both on the farm side and the retail side, it's a um, it's kind of a collateral based borrowing if they were to go into a bank. Uh, it's personal guarantees. Um, you know, it's a long, drawn-up you know process, and often um, you know they're you know they're approved for much less than what they what they've asked for. So what we can do directly is one extend uh, a bit of you know, credit limit to the to the retailer. Okay, we started to provide them also directly on the mobile a, a simple ledger where they can track payments. Uh, and orders, right? so that leads to better cash management. It leads to uh, history, uh, and we've started to develop a, um, a kind of an AI-based credit score uh, for each of these retailers that then opens them up to to formal uh, access to formal capital. Okay, uh, when you look at the um, the amount of uh, credit demand in India, and several several hundred billion dollars of of unmet credit demand. Uh, largely because it's difficult to assess uh, assess the risk worthiness of of small and micro retailers um, in a country like India. Right? But when you start to digitize uh, and you have a view into the type of transactions they're doing, uh, this becomes you know much much easier um, and to data drive how you'll how you'll do this. Okay, um, just to give you a quick idea, this is actually slightly confidential. This is uh, actual data from us and the investment that we made in electronic transactions. So what you see is uh, in a span of less than two months, in March of 2020, uh, we were at uh, 70 to 75% cash uh, collections. Okay? Uh, and through the use of data, through the use of mobile technology and connectivity um, and supporting you know, immediate payments and reconciliation, we, we moved to 97% uh, digital transactions. Okay, which brings you know, which brings a tremendous amount of uh, efficiency in, in, into the system. Okay, so when you look at this overlap of the agri space, okay, where you can use data uh, and, and technology to provide immediate demand visibility, 
you can provide pre predictive forecasts, you can provide direct market links, uh, get them better prices and access to capital. Uh, overlap that with uh, the uh, financing uh, capability, okay, where you can, on the retail side, show them exactly what products are available, in which quantity, in consistent quality, give them management tools to better manage their operations um, and, and open up to capital. Right? So I think by connecting these two, two ends, there's a, there's a tremendous opportunity um, to, to, to formalize this sector. Okay? Um, I'll talk a little bit about you know, why we launched in India. You know, as, as Yost men mentioned, uh, we are focused on, on the technology. We see similar dynamics in, in other markets, certainly in, in Africa and Latin America, parts of, parts of Asia. Okay? Uh, we launched in India because we think it's an ideal test bed. There's a um, kind of a massive uh, small microenterprise environment. Um, the parallels to other markets are, are, are fairly clear. Uh, and we have a slight advantage, I would say, uh, in, in India with, a, with a, deep, a deep technology talent pool right, that's able to build cloud technology, um, build out the apps that we're doing you know, in, in countries specific for the Indian market, but uh, with parallels that we see into, into other markets. Okay? Um, why did we approach it from a from an, an agri plus plus fintech focus? Um, as I think I mentioned earlier, it's a it's a massive market, it's, um, hundred billion dollars of internal uh, consumption, uh, and when you look at produce um, as a as a perishable, the, the the cash cycle and the rotation is very fast. Okay, so we have orders uh, consistently from our from our retail footprint every every two to three days. Uh, which means it's throwing off a, a tremendous amount of trade data okay, when you rotate this fast. You know, so on, on, on average, we have retailers ordering from us about 11, 11 times a month. Basket sizes are healthy. Um, so you start to collect this kind of information, which allows you to really uh, inform other digital products. The, the unmet credit gap is huge, so we see a, a, a good transition uh, in addition to you know, offering um, a finance product and and eventually other you know other digital products. Right? Uh, think of um, kind of crop insurance on the on the on the farm side when it's when it's pooled across a number of cooperatives. Um, you know, financing on the supply side. Uh, you know, other kind of rotating working capital needs, uh, heavy machinery financing, other things that we can layer. But once you have access to the trade data and you understand how these businesses work, what the consumption patterns are like. Uh, what the rotations are like, uh, then you're operating off of off of data and not just trying to you know trying to guess what's what's happening on on either end. Okay. Some of the things that we're learning uh, in in India that I think are probably applicable to other markets as well. Uh, you know, we're finding that not only on the the micro and small enterprise side, but on the farm side, you know, access to efficient, uh, well, I should say, efficient access to capital is one of the most pressing pressing needs okay um, you know, most of these uh, operations as i said borrow you know in, in informally um, and that really is a drag on their on their earnings and, and productivity okay um, but in order to do that we're finding that you really need to have uh, a trade linkage you need access to that trade data you need uh, to understand the, the the flows, you need to understand the frequency, um, and and without being part of the transaction, it's it's very difficult to then open uh, either party on the farm side or the supply side or on the on the retail to to capital. Right? It's, it's just too difficult. Um, you know, there are a number of micro you know finance organizations trying to do it. Obviously, um, they have to put people on the ground. You need um, you know, a way to assess risk, uh, and that's very difficult to scale. If you can, if you can get into the, um, you know, the, the transaction side, uh, digitize it, enable things like electronic payments. Um, you know, in, in, in Kenya, there's a company doing something very similar to, to us called Twiga, uh, also using, um, you know, mobile payments through M-Pesa uh, and things like that. You know, then 
uh, we have a chance of you know opening up uh, to capital and in our view not just uh, not just local capital right? but there are um, you know with the right metrics with the right credit score uh, you know at international standards with you know with rigorous risk assessment you know I think there's an opportunity to open um, you know these markets to you know to glo global pools of uh, of capital um, which I think will bring a a tremendous amount of value to the to the ag sector. Um, uh, so that's our experience in in, in India. Uh, thank you all for your time and attention. Um, I think we see you know a massive uh, opportunity uh, on how to apply technology, uh, data, data analysis on on making both of these ends you know, more more efficient and um, uh, and improving outcomes. Thank you very much. That's, that's great stuff, and uh, I really appreciate you sharing this. And um, um, so wonderful uh, to free up your time for the for this. I um, I noticed a couple of questions already when uh, as as the presentations were held. Um, so what I want to suggest is that uh, as we are now at the end of the formal uh, part in terms of the presentations. Uh, that we take uh, the next uh, 10 minutes or so to to allow uh, for some uh, questions and, uh, and answers or maybe some discussion if there are specific items which come up. Um, so I noted a few questions already and I will try to sort of point them to the, the appropriate person or, or company or organization. Um, let me start by a question. I think it was from the gentleman uh, from ETG. Um, uh, to, and I would like to ask that to Venetia. I think Grace touched on it briefly, but it might be good to understand because obviously I think it's a, it's a key question if you run a business. The data updates on, of the, uh, uh, the data you shared with us, Venetia, can you give us a bit of an, an insight or understanding on how often, how frequent these data are updated? So it gives a sense of, let's say, how much up to uh, up with with with, with uh, the actual situation those numbers are, and and maybe uh, after you have uh, uh, responded to this, Venetia, maybe it would be interesting as well to hear the same uh, from you, Antonella. Uh, although you come from a diff bit of a different angle, but obviously you're also, you know, covering some of these uh, 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 data fields. So please, uh, uh, Venetia, uh, uh, if you are there, yes, you are. Yes. Hey, thank you. Um, no, that's a really good question. Um, so the system has lots of different kinds of data. So maybe I can walk you through some of it. So the price data. Uh, the FOB and the retail prices will be updated monthly as they're collected. Um, and then the consumption data is collected through IFDC's, um, FT.WG's, the fertilizer technical working groups, which meet annually um, with public and private sector in each of the countries. So once the customs data becomes available for the previous year so that will be added annually um and then the cost buildup data doesn't change a whole lot you know year to year but it will like if so those will be refreshed say every few years well we'll put in the new fob data so the calculations will change but in um, like each of the cost components which might, might might be based on like a percentage like if those don't change then we wouldn't update those so that that would be every like couple of years but um the 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 system updates the data sort of um quickest is monthly and then the longest could be yearly or semi annually yeah great finisha thanks so much um antonella uh, on your end how 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 well are you able to update the data or how frequent it does, it does it happen and yes. a additional point to this is a question on the coverage of data from zimbabwe zambia and mozambique which was also asked by somebody um, okay. because it seems to be a bit thinner compared
compared to some of the other countries? Well, first of all, I, I have to say that obviously I don't produce the data. I use the data of the association. There are three key components to this data. There are numbers that come from IFA, um, so the International First Grade Association is mainly imports and export into Africa. And then I got um, the numbers that come from AFO, IFTC, AFO, um, and AFAP. AFAP feeds into AFO, you know, East Africa, West Africa, and Southern Africa. Um, collecting data and uh, making sure they are uh, reliable is the most difficult job that you know somebody can do takes time takes time it takes resources and therefore it takes it has a cost like any business um usually the the figures on import and exports are collected uh, uh, by IFA on an annual basis, they collect it on a quarterly basis, but to be reliable, you have to wait until the end of the year to have the full set of data for the year. And therefore, there is always a time lag of at least one year before you get all the data. They are generally collected by IFA based on uh, producer, but based on members' input, you know, collection from members directly. Um, the data from um, from um, AFO, they are collected, I believe, based on customs and also based on uh, research on the fields, you know. So it all this depends and, and they, they will allow also them to step in, you know, to support this. But I would say that uh, I came across many times the difficulty of getting some information on specific countries versus other countries in uh, Africa sub-Sahara because maybe the countries are smaller, um, they, there is less finance to collect the data on a particular year, while uh, so some other countries there are some donors that support that, and so it's easier. Um, on the specific question about Zimbabwe, Zambia, Mozambique, I think that if you look at my Africa uh, portal, uh, you will see that um, you have the same, more or less the same, um, information in there, so you get all the information collected. Uh, but obviously, in countries like Zimbabwe and Zambia, which are landlocked, um, sometimes it's difficult to judge the import and the export because they may be coming from a different port and then transported in land, which is one of the major issues anyway, not only for data collection but for trade in uh, Africa sub Sahara. So um, it's not an easy process, and um, every time you need more uh, more input, more research, more resources, more finance to do that. Like for example, at the moment, I'm I really think I developed the portal because I wanted to develop quickly to make sure that I went a step farther in in visualizing the data of Africa. But I then realized, and that's where technology designing comes in, that um, I could only really do the interactive version with the funds that I had until then uh, accessible on uh, on the desktop. While I think that the next step will be to develop uh, accessibility by mobile and uh, laptops, because when we, when you come to smallholders, farmers, or smaller actors, certainly mobile um, is a technology that plays quite a good thing. Now, if uh, Afo, Grace, or even Sandra wants to add more about the collection of data and, uh, and the availability of data, please uh, chip in. <laughs> okay, okay, understood. Thank you so much, uh, Antonella. Um, Ronald, a uh, question. Do you already have a question? Uh, can you uh, tell us a little bit about where, where that is? And, and, and the second question for you, is uh, your solution is is really exciting uh, and how about accessibility uh, i struggle with this the degree of sophistication you're you're offering uh i could not get your first question uh yoast uh, what was your first question your footprint in africa uh your presence yeah. in africa with your solution so far yes Okay, so uh, we have around uh, thousand uh, 
uh, individual farmers in Africa. Um, and uh, those are spread over uh, Nigeria, Kenya, Tanzania, South Africa and Zimbabwe at this moment. And your second question was? Hello? Yeah. The question was uh, with regards to the accessibility to farmers who do not have the same uh, degree of education or training. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you uh, if you look at our interface, uh, um, I mean, we do not uh, tire the farmers with a lot of um, uh, th dots that they have to connect themselves. We actually uh, create a ballpark figure in terms of suitability on products. Uh, by the amount of percentage that it would work in that uh, conditions. So that means that uh, uh, all the data that we are gathering, and I, I, we assume a farmer does not and cannot gather that type of information, uh, 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 yeah, and, and not even be able to, when there's so much data, to interpret all that uh, uh, into a correlated way. So we uh, 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 tend to uh, jut that down into a single uh, uh, single figure, which means a percentage suitability. Also, uh, in terms of the usefulness of uh, uh, forecasts, etc., cetera, um, I know that uh, and, uh, we have seen a lot, that a lot of farmers, they are just knowing the prices in their region. They compare that to our forecasted prices and then say, okay, yeah, that's that's true. So so you have to comply most, most what they, they do know and build that trust on the system. Uh, if, for instance, uh, a farmer cannot uh, 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 draw his parcel because he has never done that before, we also provide before he becomes, uh, 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 before he gets a license, we make sure uh, through videos uh, that he can actually uh, 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 draw his parcel. And our mobile app uh, is uh, uh, a little bit different than our uh, cloud-based map so in the mobile screen size is much smaller so you have to you don't even have to uh, uh, for instance create your parcel just uh, put a point in the Google Maps where your parcel is located so so we really try to um, make it foolproof with double O uh, in terms of that everybody can be using our system in that sense. And if you want to go into depth, you can go into depth through all the graphs that uh, you've seen uh, through the, in the movie. Great. Well, thanks so much for uh, addressing uh, to address this. Uh, again, you know, there will also be ample opportunity, of course, to, to, uh, to connect offline uh, uh, for any bilateral uh, interactions. And if that is a problem, you can always reach out to us in order to be connected. Um, Yash, uh, a few questions for you. Um, first of all, uh, with regards to the product, because you're dealing with perishables, how do you manage product quality? Uh, I'm not even talking about the, 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 the product losses, which are obviously vast in, in, with perishable product, but more about standards of quality, certification, uh, uh, that, that type of thing. And then second, uh, I also saw that in the chat box already, uh, currently, you don't have a footprint in Africa, uh, but there is clearly some appetite from different angles. I noticed an interest from Indorama in Nigeria. I noticed uh, another question from AFAP on that aspect. Uh, how do you view? Uh, uh, how do you view your uh, uh, interest or appetite to have a presence in Africa? Uh, sure. So those questions over to you. Okay, sure. Thanks, you. I think for the, the first question um, on, on product quality, okay, um, you know, the first step, first step for us is uh, to get the, the, the systems, the algorithms, uh, and, the, and the platform uh, moving, so to speak. Yeah? Uh, so today we focus on what you could call, um, maybe we call them sort of semi semi perishable or at least slightly longer shelf life products um, so bananas apple um, you know pomegranate um, you know watermelon um, you know oranges things like that um, and the way we we manage the perishability is that we uh, and this is the the, the power of, of data and transparency right? 
is that we do not hold inventory for more than two days. Okay, so when we when we aggregate the demand off of our off of our platform, and you start to provide uh, forecasts, rolling forecast, uh, you know AI driven you know prediction, we have uh, we have a very high confidence in the commitments we can make to the farmer organization. Okay, so when we go to uh, a small farmer or small farmer organization. Um, and make a commitment for you know for 500 boxes of, of apples. We are pretty confident using the data that there's demand in our footprint for 500 boxes. Okay, so the turnaround for us is is very very quick. Uh, and as we uh, as we tighten that up even more, then we'll able to we'll be able to organize the back end supply chains to then deal with you know even more even more perishable products. Um, just to give you an example, last last year uh, in the mango season, uh, which is highly highly perishable, particularly because it's a, it's a summer fruit, and uh, without cold store in India, temperatures are reaching you know 40 45 degrees, so it's a it's a it's a very very tight cycle for a product like mangoes, and last year we successfully did close to 1,000 1,000 tons of of mango. Uh, through through our system, uh, but this is the this is the advantage of, of data use. Okay, when right. when you can aggregate the demand, you know that the demand is confident. Uh, you can provide that transparency into the supply side. Uh, then you don't have to sort of speculate and, and carry inventories for you know, for long periods of time you know, or put things in cold storage. Right? So that's that's the advantage uh, for us. Um, on the second question. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we're, we're focused on building uh, this kind of asset light tech tech enabled uh, model uh, with plans to grow. Uh, we we haven't launched in in Africa yet, uh, but um, you know, being born in my in, in Nairobi, my my heart is in Kenya, so I'd, I'd love the opportunity to speak to anyone who's interested in looking how we could uh, deploy in, in in Africa. Right. Right, that would be fantastic, and and do keep us uh, engaged there because we would love to know how you're how you're doing, how you're evolving your business there, and and in the partnerships. Um, question to you, Chilande Grace. Uh, um, two questions actually. You mentioned the difficulties of movement of products and and and, uh, and, and persons in West Africa. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on how that is now evolving and um, how you also see that in terms of uh, uh, the COVID-19 lockdown uh, uh, um, uh, developing? Is that changing a lot? Uh, what is what is what's going on there? Just, just a quick snapshot, please. And 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 two, I got a question about Botswana. Apparently, that's not part of your data collection. It might actually be related also to Antonella's. Uh, if that is indeed the case, uh, wait, wait, wait. okay. Um, thank you. Uh, yes. So, uh, when it comes to movement, the, the comment that I made was that there's different countries had different restrictions on COVID and on movement uh, for the different uh, for within their countries. So, the comment I was making with regards to the COVID watches, we are monitoring how. Uh, those restrictions are affecting movement of product. So ideally in West Africa, the season was not yet on. So movement of product was not ideally very limited. But uh, the thing is we would be assessing it in the coming month or so just to assess whether product is moving uh, efficiently. And if so, uh, and if not, then what, what, what are the actual issues at the borders? And then how would those issues be corrected? So for now, I we cannot clearly say that there's a problem in West Africa, but what we do understand, and I could maybe draw it back to East Africa, is countries like, uh, let's say, Uganda and Rwanda had their borders closed, and so product could not, uh, there's no there's limitation on movement of people, and then ideally there was uh, delays of product or cargo moving across the borders, and this would see uh, two to five day delays uh, in moving product, which then has an implication on uh, cost of the product at the end of the day. So that's something that we're constantly monitoring. 
When it comes to Botswana, the question was asked on the basis of why we don't cover certain markets. And uh, this is, uh, like I mentioned, it's based on demand for data, based on demand for information, as well as the market size. So is this a growing market? Is this a big market? And then is there interest from a regional or an international uh, perspective for players to come and develop those markets? So if there's interest there, then we have uh, an incentive for us to collect and monitor that market. But if a market is very small or has limited uh, growth in the fertilizer sector or in the agricultural sector, then there's also that also translates in the limitation of people being interested in the data. Okay, great, great. Thank you for this uh, comprehensive uh, response. Um, well, we are getting to the the end of uh, of this webinar. So unfortunately, uh, we there's no window anymore for 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 sharing further questions uh, uh, and and having this interaction continue. But I think it's been really exciting. Obviously, there's still the chance to to you know continue having you know some interactions over the chat uh, or during the final minutes uh, of this webinar, and you will be able to connect offline as well. Of course, I saw that there was already some answers being provided. Um, I would like to now move to uh, the final section. Um, we have been now uh, uh, able to. Uh, discuss um, along three very exciting uh, themes in my view, which is along market insights, retail trading, and farmland optimization with the different uh, presentations we had and, and the related uh, discussions. And I think if you boil it down, it comes back to the, the point I tried to address in the opening session as well. If you look at data, which is a really, you know, a, 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 a box full of quantities, characters, and symbols, that only has any sense if you're able to somehow give that context in terms of logic using the right interface, the user interface, and leveraging different technologies and logic uh, available in the, in, the, in, in the context of algorithms or machine learning, artificial intelligence, and that there's, there's a whole world behind all those on how you then can make some sense out of this data, but it really comes down, comes down at the end of the day to the impact. How does it really translate into transactions on the ground, livelihood enhancement, and, and you know, specific market structured uh, dynamics, demand, supply, and yields. And that can only work, this dynamic, if it's backed up by strong public-private partnerships, which secure and backstop inclusion and a broad support with right stakeholders and good funding to get it initially going, and a business model which makes sure that it can sustain. With those closing words, I would like to actually uh, uh, hand over to the real closing remarks from our president and CEO, Jason, uh, Jason Sparponi. I, uh, I, I do understand he's still uh, available and online. I, I sincerely hope so at any rate. So if that is indeed the case, Jason, uh, I would really like to invite you to uh, provide some closing remarks uh, so that we can uh, close this uh, this very exciting and interesting webinar together uh, with your words and observations. The floor is yours, uh, Jason. Sandra, do you know whether Jason is still present? Um, he might have left. Okay, because I I did notice that he was online earlier on, so that might be an connectivity uh, issue there. Yeah. Okay. Um, listen, guys. Obviously, I'm not in the same position as uh, as Jason is, but um, what I can tell you is obviously uh, what we've been discussing today has been, you know, really cool for me at any rate to participate in. I'm, I'm really impressed also with the degree of uh, of engagement, interaction, and feedback. And um, uh, what I would really appreciate is if you do continue to participate uh, and uh, 
and work with us on these type of interactions. We will continue to organize these webinars. There's still a couple of really exciting ones coming up again soon, uh, because if there's anything key in this, uh, in this strange era, is that we reach out to one another and continue to exchange these type of relevant insights uh, as a community, uh, as brothers and sisters. Again, thank you very much, and I uh, God bless you, and uh, do reach out to one another offline or come back to us if there's anything uh, you would like us to enable or facilitate or liaise uh, on. All right? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, Just. Thanks very much, Just. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye to everybody. Thank you, goodbye. I think I'm going to get a cup of tea now. Cheers. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thanks to everyone. <laughs> Thank you.